This is a recording from Queen's University Belfast, School of Nursing and Midwifery. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this uh, I'll stay behind the desk, then it's easier. Uh, you're all very welcome this afternoon uh, to celebrate a very important occasion with the School of Nursing and Midwifery here at Queen's University Belfast. And uh, it's very important for us uh, to, to welcome, to begin with, our, our, our final year students because it's great to see you here in s- such good numbers and here to hear from people who have went before really in this profession uh, on, on a very important topic, that of leadership uh, and women in leadership in particular. And even in this audience with all the steps we take to improve the ratio of men to women in our course the, there's still a very important theme for this school and this school in particular and one that we're very uh, proud to drive forward. Uh, it's also my honour uh, to welcome uh, uh, Jean Orr who was the first head of school of nursing and midwifery here in Queen's and uh, this uh, lecture has been named in her honour and it, it is a great honour that we have Jean with us here today. It's a particular pleasure for me to welcome uh, Professor Charlotte McArdle, Chief Nursing Officer here uh, to the School of Nursing and Midwifery. And I know uh, that, like, like uh, me, many of you are looking forward to her address this afternoon. So no pressure, Charlotte. <laughs> uh, it's, it's always a pleasure to uh, meet with and work with our colleagues in the department. And you're very, very welcome here today. Uh, I just want to begin by explaining to you why we have this lecture and uh, I think it is important that we all understand the underpinnings of it and how we got here today. This is an Athena Swan initiative and for that reason I'm particularly uh, glad that uh, Susan Clark and other members of the Athena Swan team within the School of Nursing and Midwifery are here. And what is Athena Swan, I hear many of you say. What, what is that about? Well, that is an initiative to drive forward equality and diversity within academia. It was traditionally uh, at its inception about uh, gender uh, equality within uh, academia, but now it is much more about that wider piece about diversity and uh, equality for all. So it, it is about women, but it's about much more than women. Is that, is that a fair summary, Susan? Uh, and it really is a very great, good opportunity for us as a school to sit back, reflect and think about everything that we do and every uh, process which we initiate and ask ourselves, is this really uh, swan friendly? Is it encouraging uh, the diversity of our workforce to be reflected in the outworkings of everything that we do and everything that we're for. So we invest really heavily in this and just this gives me a great opportunity to say again uh, to Susan, congratulations because this year we uh, were successfully reallocated a Silver Swan Award and that's a tremendous achievement representing a great deal of hard work and leadership and that's very timely because obviously that's what this lecture is all about so thanks to uh, Susan and the whole Swan team for the leadership that has driven forward this initiative of the inaugural Jean Orr lecture within the school. So uh, it would be uh, really important and uh, very remiss of me if I didn't uh, say a few words about Jean given this auspicious occasion. And I want to say, in the interests of academic uh, uh, credibility here, that I've garnered and I'm plagiarising heavily Jane Coyle's interview uh, with Professor Orr uh, from back in 2006. Uh, so just so that, so that my uh, work is carefully uh, uh, acknowledged as, as that that uh, Coyle submitted in, in 2006. Jean was a trailblazer. When she uh, entered the school in 1991, she was the only female head of school in the university. So that really puts it in context, the, the doors and the new ground, she, the door she was opening, the new ground she was breaking, not just for our profession of nursing and midwifery, but for our gender in particular as women uh, within this university. 
And whenever she joined, she apparently, uh, like all um, smart women do, asked the Vice Chancellor what her package would include. And he sort of quizzically looked at her and uh, he said, well, quite frankly, I doubt there's even a pencil that comes along with this chair, but you, you feel free to uh, cr be creative and uh, develop what you need, the tools you need for the job. And no better woman to do that than Professor Orr. She set about uh, her business from uh, the, the basement of the Faculty of Medicine and went on to create a school with 140 staff, as we know today, and uh, several thousand students, of which we're very, very proud. And from those humble beginnings, uh, we also made a, a wide <coughs> impact uh, on society in Northern Ireland. And it, it uh, became, uh, the breakthrough really came in 1996, when using all of her business acumen, uh, Jean, uh, along with the uh, current registrar, but then bursar of the university, James O'Kane, uh, successfully pitched um, for the contract for pre and post uh, registration uh, midwifery education. And that was really a coup. And I, working in another university, really felt the impact of that. But certainly for Queen's, it was a real feather in your cap. And I think it's something for which you should justly be proud. Uh, I think your influencing skills uh, came to the fore, not just in that, but in the, the transfer of staff from the schools and colleges of nursing into the university that happened in September 1997. And that also gives us another date that it's good to be uh, having this lecture 20 years later, September uh, uh, 2017. It's, it's great that we're in this position now with such strength and it is a real credit to you and your skills. As well as that, um, uh, Professor Orr has always demonstrated her ability to advocate for uh, the, the issues within society that are important, not just to nursing, but to the wider uh, societal impact that they have. And if you think about uh, her role uh, as, a, as a feminist and a self-admitted and proud one, I'm sure, she has uh, been very, very passionate about women's health, about issues uh, such, such as uh, the increase in AIDS in, in Africa and the horrors of the sex trade and uh, has taken that into another arena now and I'm very uh, great, grateful that Mary Louise is here from Wave to acknowledge that um, Jean is now a very fond uh, advocate for uh, the Wave initiative which is around uh, supporting victims of violence and, uh, and division within uh, Northern Ireland. Her, she has co-edited a book called Nurses' Voices from the Troubles and I think that also represents her innovation and her collaboration. Um, we're very proud that you have uh, an honorary uh, position with us now, uh, Professor Orr, uh, because we uh, really value the characteristics that you embody. You're dynamic, you're original, and you're not afraid to, to take a, a, a punt and, and bring people with you in doing so. And those team building skills, I believe, were very much to the fore in the annual pantomime that you staged. And I think a, a key uh, aspect of the job, a key tool that I miss in my repertoire is your uh, tinsel wand. I could very often do with a magic wand in my office for some of the, the difficulties uh, that one faces today. I mean, I, I don't need to underscore your achievements any further. You were born and raised in Belfast. You had a career that spanned uh, both acute and uh, primary care nursing and health visiting in particular. You were educated in Manchester, one of the foremost universities in uh, nursing and midwifery academia in the UK. And um, you, you have come back to, to Northern Ireland and given so generously of your talents and abilities. And we're really honoured to have you here today. I would encourage all of you in the audience to sit back and listen because the experience, the cumulative experience that is in this room, not just from Professor Orr but also uh, from Professor McArdle uh, in her address that she's about to begin just now, will tell us very, very much about key steps on that leadership journey 
that uh, we are all on. And I'd just really like to, to close um, my introduction by saying uh, that Jean's analysis uh, of her job as head of school, she used a, a very interesting metaphor, and I wish I'd known this a year ago whenever I took up post. She said, mine is a tough job, but I love it. Okay with that? I would compare it to an Indiana Jones movie. No sooner have you climbed out of the snake pit than a huge boulder comes bearing down on you, closely followed by a, a cloud of killer ants. Well, there, there are those challenges every day, I think, in each of our uh, domains. And nothing in that respect has really, really changed. But in, in, in uh, meeting those challenges and in preparing for, for the future, I think it's really important that we look at the legacy of the past that we're building on and the shoulders of the giants on which we uh, can uh, bear our weight. And I certainly value the role models that we have in both uh, Professor R and Professor McArdle uh, to draw on your experience as we face the current challenges facing our profession. And I feel, I'm sure, like you do, very proud and privileged to welcome both of you to this arena this evening. So thank you for that. And uh, just to say a few words about our Chief Nursing Officer. Uh, as Head of Nursing and Midwifery Professions, uh, Charlotte McArdle is responsible for professional leadership, performance and development. And this includes <coughs> supporting the department's allied health professionals. So it's a, it's a wide remit and a very challenging one. I think it's fair to say that you have uh, set out a very challenging uh, strategic direction for our professions and that we are currently as leaders within this field being brought around the table with Charlotte and with many other players to really solve and tackle some very difficult issues and to work in a very collaborative and uh, cohesive fashion as professionals and I welcome that opportunity very much. During the time uh, that you've been enrolled in, in the few short years that you've been there now, you've led a number of very important initiatives that underpin um, uh, uh, professional practice, such as person care standards and record keeping and practice, policy imperatives, delivering care, nurse staffing levels in Northern Ireland, supporting quality 2020. And you've played a key role in the development of the attributes framework for leadership in quality improvement and safety. I know that you also chair the Northern Ireland Key Performance Indicator Advisory Board for Nursing and Midwifery and uh, you lead on policy and patient experience and nutrition uh, for the Department of Health and therefore I think we can all concur that there's a lot in your experience that we would be keen to draw on and we look forward very much to your words of wisdom. Thank you. Join me in welcoming uh, Charlotte McCarty. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just leave this here. Um, I won't be dancing, so it'll be all right. I'll just stay here. Delighted to, um, to be here uh, this afternoon um, to share with you some experiences around uh, leadership. Um, and I'm very delighted to be here to give the inaugural lecture prof <coughs> Professor uh, Jean Orr. Um, Jean, uh, I don't even know if Donna knows this. I'm, I'm going to drop the formalities and the, you know, the um, titles just um, from now on, uh, just to say that uh, Jean has made uh, an immense contribution to nursing and midwifery education, has, as Donna has, has already said, and um, I am absolutely delighted to be here today. But um, she, she has also um, had a huge impact on me uh, and my um, career so far, and I don't know if, if Donna, Donna knew this. Um, when she uh, she asked me to to join you today, but um, Jean's encouraged me um, uh, tremendously as a young ward sister. I remember I was twenty nine. I had just had my first child. She was one, and I was undertaking my master's degree here at, at Queen's in nursing. And Jean was my supervisor, and we had lots of many ch long chats in her in her room, and very a lot of very philosophical debates. And indeed, um, she introduced me to a book called The Politics of Nursing, written by Jane Salvage, which stays with me. And actually, I had the opportunity to meet Jane uh, about two weeks ago, and I was telling her um, about how I had been given the book by, by Jane and how I utilised it in my dissertation for my master's, and how I had 
shaped and uh, driven me in, in my career and some of the things that I hold dear uh, about nursing and about life um, and all of that. So, so thank you very much. I am genuinely delighted uh, to be here this afternoon. A little bit about me. Um, I, I trained in, in Bowman Hospital in, in Dublin. Um, back in the 80s, it was pretty hard to get into nursing. And, and so I had to wait. I, I left school in 85 and it took me three years uh, to, to, get, to get a place in nursing. But I was absolutely determined that I was going to do it. And I was, I was determined that I was going to do it at home, that I wasn't, I wasn't going to go away to do it. So, so that's why <coughs> the delay. But then I, I, moved, um, I moved to Belfast and I worked at Musgrave Park for, for quite some years before going to the Royal to become a sister. And that's where, where um, I, I met Jean. That was a busy year. Um, I was awarded a Nursing Times Foundation of Nursing Studies Leadership Award for the work that I'd done in my ward. And then I, I, I started on my journey of my, my MSc. Went into senior management at the Royal as a senior leader, thinking naively that I could do what I did in my ward uh, in, in changing practice and being creative and innovative and using practice development um, at directorate level. And then you suddenly realise that mm, it's not really quite that easy. You know, I had 16 different wards and departments to manage and each one of them came with a ward sister or charge nurse. And they all had their own personality and their own priorities and their own things that they wanted to do. And sometimes mine and theirs didn't always align up. So, so it, it was much slower than, than I thought. However, I did progress in my career through to Deputy Director of Nursing and then Director of Nursing in the South Eastern Trust from 2007, um, and then to the Department of Health as the Chief Nurse. And of all of those roles, I suppose what I'd say, that the two that stand out, apart from the one that I'm in now, is my Ward Sisters role and my Director of Nursing role, because I think they're the two roles for me that have really given me the opportunity to influence and impact on care, one in a ward environment and one just taking the, all of the principles that you would use in a ward and apply them right across the South Eastern Trust. Um, this is a, a photograph um, of me as a student nurse in my last year. We had red badges and you know, we didn't have epaulettes then uh, at the back, um, second from, the, from that side, um, the left. Um, and, and that's a photograph of me getting my, uh, my degree because I trained in the old model where we didn't, we didn't have graduate uh, nurses at that, at that time and I trained in a hospital environment and then subsequently went on and co completed my degree at the University of Manchester. Um, this is uh, my being awarded my master's degree and you can see Jean there in the front. Um, and this is my, my certificate of nursing from, from the hospital to actually demonstrate that I am a credible nurse. And, and can undertake the functions in some shape or form um, of a nurse. But in thinking about what matters to me and what drives me in my career, I went back to this definition from Virginia Henderson, I'm sure you're all very familiar with it, around the unique function of a nurse is to assist and enable, uh, in, to assist the individual, sick or well, in the performance of those activities, contributing to health in its recovery or to a peaceful death, and that he would perform unaided and if he had the necessary strength, will and knowledge. And of course, it is a little bit outdated in some ways, but in other ways it's very contemporary. And that's one of the things about great, great nurse leaders, uh, both here in Northern Ireland and, and elsewhere, that their work is, is always current. Um, and it's always very applicable to your, your practice. Um, <coughs> for me, it's an absolute privilege to be, to be a nurse. Uh, and it's a privilege for all of us, I think, to be with people at the most vulnerable times in their lives, whether they're happy times or sad times, but it's the opportunity and the privilege to share in those experiences of people and their family. One of the main drivers for me is, is, um, is the privileges that, that nursing brings to share in those intimate experiences that people go through. Um, and, that, and that really, from, a, from the chief nurse perspective, that's one of the things that drives me to make sure that the standards that people receive are the highest that we can possibly make them. Working, accepting that you know, there are difficulties and there are challenges and all of those issues, but we absolutely do our best uh, for the people that we provide care for. So I'm very proud to be a nurse, I always have been. I'm very proud of our profession, uh, professions, because I see some midwives here as well. Um, and uh, I'm very proud, very proud of the job, the job that I do in representing your voice um, and your experience and your input at, at government level to ensure that we make good policy and to ensure that I provide good um, advice uh, to the ministers and the, and the assembly when we have one, needless to say. Um, 
So nursing has been very good to me and I think it will be very good to you too if you nurture it and support it and look after it all of your life because nursing, nursing has never been a job for me, it's always been a way of being. It's as important how you get on and behave off duty as it is on duty, so it's a way of being, it isn't just, it's just a job and I don't think that any of us um, ever entered nursing um, because we wanted a job, it's because we wanted uh, to do something very meaningful with our lives. The essence of, of nursing, and uh, this is a quote from um, McCormick and McCants, the <coughs> ideals of humanistic care, and where there is a moral component in practice, has at its basis a therapeutic intent which is translated through relationships that are built upon effective interpersonal process. This is intrinsic to the person-centred practice framework, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and recognised model of, of nursing internationally. And this is work that was, has been developed the evidence base has been built up, the uh, experience has been sought, the model has been tried in practice over years and years and um, way back into the early 2000s um, working on this model and it's now internationally recognised. But for me it's about person-centred practice and it's about putting the people that we care for right at the centre of that model. That's the model itself, the latest version just issued um, this year. It's had several iterations and, and several changes and been refined along the way and I'm sure, I'm sure that this isn't the first time that, that you've seen that. Um, and then just to unpick that a little bit, there are a number of prerequisites, the attributes of the nurse, the things that we need as nurses and midwives to be able to do our job. Um, the, the environment in which we work in, the context in which you're trying to deliver care. So many of the issues that the nurses are currently fa facing and, and the midwives as well, and you'll see this when you're out in practice, around workforce issues, around the availability of staff, around the complexity of patients, around the equipment that's available for you to do, to do the job that needs to be done, are all considered in that, in that um, care environment. Um, the care processes then are, are delivering care through a range of different activities. So the things that we do to enable us to begin to have those conversations with patients and their families or with communities or with clients in their own home, depending on where you're providing that care. And then fundamentally it's about outcomes, it's about the results of all of that. How do we actually articulate what it is that we bring to care? What is the unique <coughs> contribution that midwifery and nursing offers? Uh, in, in a world at the moment that's very financially challenged and very performance driven. How do we maximise those opportunities and how do we demonstrate our outcomes? And this framework provides us with some opportunities to do that. Um, in terms of values and beliefs, I, I, I do believe that uh, good leaders have very strong values and beliefs. Um, and my values and beliefs have always been, to sum it all up I suppose, around care and compassion and around dignity and respect and equality of opportunity. And I think nursing and midwifery is steeped in, 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 in a, a, social, a social theory construct, although we deliver it through sometimes a, a very medical dominated model and sometimes those things get mixed up and lost. But I think primarily nursing is about social justice and, and you, you see that replicated in some of the work that, that nurse leaders do, um, both locally, nationally and in, internationally. But in this model, we are talking about working with the person's beliefs and values. And, and uh, one of the things about the person-centred practice framework is that it's not just all about the patients and their families. It's actually about how we interact with staff. And lots of the evidence tells us that in order for you guys to, prefer, to perform at your best and provide the best care that you can for the people that you're working with, then your organisations need to support you to do that. And it needs to show compassion and it needs to be caring to, to you as individuals. It enables you to be uh, authentic in your approach, to involve people in decision making, to be there for people. Sometimes we, we can't sympathise or even empathise with people if you haven't stood in their shoes, but you can be there and you can support people. And sometimes as much as a gentle touch or just to be present is enough in some situations to people feel supported. And again, the one thing that I think is uniquely different about nursing and midwifery is the, the application of holistic care. It's the one group of professions that provide that um, holistic approach, has most contact with the patient and provides 24 7 day a week care for people. So in terms of um, person-centred outcomes, the outcomes we're looking for are good experience of care, good involvement in care, a feeling of well-being. Um, a feeling that you've done a good job, a feeling that you've been cared for, even if the outcome is a peaceful death. It's, it's maybe not a good outcome in terms of, 
what you would like, but it's the experience of going through that process and feeling that people valued and cared for you and the existence of a healthful culture, a culture that um, supports its staff and supports the people that, that they care for. Um, midwives, mums and babies, birthing pool and the past president of the RCM uh, are all in this picture, Leslie Page, um, at the Daisy Hill Midwifery Lead Unit. And that's an, an example of midwifery um, at its best in terms of providing midwifery lead care, uh, ensuring that those mums who use that service have end to end midwifery care continuously um, provided by, where possible, the same midwife or at least a small team of midwives. Um, and the feedback from midf midwifery lead un units has been fantastic for those who, who can use it. So that's a, an example of excellence, an example of leadership. Um, for midwives to be able to step up to the plate and say we can do this and we can do it differently and, and, and we're going to show you how we can do it. Um, so, um, in terms of nursing leadership then, uh, the person-centred nursing framework itself, just in, 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 in identifying strong nurse leaders uh, that have come from Northern Ireland, um, this, this model has been globally adopted it's been translated into three different languages that I know of, and maybe more. It's been embedded in practice across the world. It underpins the delivery and the improvements in practice, and influences and underpins strategy and policy. It's a th it provides a theoretical framework, I suppose a new model for nursing, uh, and as, as part of um, the curriculum in terms of a theoretical framework develops outcomes and uh, contributes to the f further enhancement of our, of our body of knowledge uh, with regard to nursing. So I think we have a lot to uh, be proud of in Northern Ireland in terms of the calibre of some of the nurses that, that emerge from, from, from this system. And you'll know as well as I do, and it was said to me very recently that uh, nurses from Northern Ireland are sought after all over the world and people just can't get them quickly enough and enough of them. And I think that's, that's testament to the quality of the pre-registration education that you guys get here at Queen's, but also <coughs> is provided at Ulster and at Open University for those who choose to, um, who choose to use, the, use that route. <coughs> Key leadership behaviours for me, I've taken this from the Institute of Healthcare Improvement. Um, which is an, a, an American institute, but really majors on quality and safety initiatives uh, around the world. And these leadership behaviours are the five that I try to stick to, don't always get it right. Um, but the first one is person-centredness, and being consistently person-centred, but all in word and in deed. It's not just about saying the right words, it's about doing the right thing, and about making it very obvious to people um, that you have their interests um, at heart. Engaging with the front line is really difficult in my job. Um, it's very time consuming and some days it's much easier just to sit in your office and do your emails and answer your correspondence and have meetings and all of that. But I get huge benefit from going out to talk to people. Um, it keeps me close to, to care, it keeps me close to practice. Um, and I'm, I, I've left the South Eastern Trust in four and a half years in this job and I feel, I feel sometimes a little bit disconnected. So that reconnection for me is really important back, back to practice. And when I go out, I meet students and I always ask the students uh, how they're getting on and um, how they feel about their, 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 their placements. And in the main, I get extremely good feedback, which is always reassuring. A re relentless focus. Um, keep focused on the main objectives, whatever your main objective is, because there's so many competing agendas. There are so many different priorities. It's easy to get lost. Um, in the quagmire of things that need to be done. So, and one of the things about being a leader is I in your role, you've got to find opportunities to do the thing that you like to do. So just a little bit of time crafted into your working week to allow you to develop your skills or your sense of inquiry or your writing ability or your management style, or your leadership ability, whatever it is. But it is really important that you have something in your working week that allows you to do something that you like to do as well as all the other busy things that you have to do. Openness and transparency, I think, is, is very core for me. Um, being open and honest with people, if I get it wrong, <coughs> as much as sometimes I don't like to say I got it wrong or I'm sorry, I always do that. And I say I'm sorry where I know I've made a mistake or where I could have done things better. And I think people really respect that and understand that we're all human and we don't all get it right all of the time. And, and that we work in it and it's sometimes um, uh, a system that 
I mean, healthcare is not risk free. It's never going to be risk free. And we're all human and we have good days and bad days. And sometimes, some days we do things well and sometimes there are other things going on in our life um, that, that prevent you being your best that day. And everybody's open to make mistakes and everyone's open to error, but none of us get out of bed in the morning to do a bad job. And none of us get out of bed to go in and do harm to anybody. So the ability to be open and transparent about all of your work and your, and your professional life is important. And this notion of being boundarylessness is even hard to say. Encourage and practice um, systems thinking and collaboration across boundaries. Think it out of your little space, your little box, um, you know, looking at the bigger picture, trying to see what's happening elsewhere, looking for best practice and bringing them back to your, to your, to your everyday uh, work. So in terms of women and leadership, well, what does that really mean? Um, I suppose I was asking myself, and why is it different in nursing and how do we apply it in our context? And Donna already says, what about men who work in nursing and midwifery who are, who are currently undergoing their program or have qualified? Um, how do they feel about, uh, about all of this? The evidence, whenever I was uh, doing some preparation for this, suggests that women tend to have a range of strengths that make them really great leaders, but as yet we haven't really seen equal reward for that work, I think it's fair to say. Um, the evidence also suggests that the kind of traits that women have are those that are really needed for transformational leadership. And, and transformational leadership is, is, is the type of leadership at the moment that everybody is focused on um, in terms of transforming the service, thinking about how we can do things differently, being creative, being innovative, using the best evidence. It's all about how we transform the service that we currently have. And by nature, women are more participatory in their style. They like to work collegiately, they like to talk things through, they like to engage with people, they like to get consensus. Um, and they seek to motivate their staff and use an assets-based approach, building on the best skills that they have within their team. Women will help staff to develop their self-worth and their sense of satisfaction, whereas men, on the other hand, are more process-orientated, so they're really good at the planning and the performance and making sure things go to, to plan, and um, that things are delivered on time, uh, and, and all of those kinds of things. And they're also better in the command and control structure. So if women are more collaborative and men are more, uh, and I should say we can't generalise here, but these are just, these are just traits. Uh, command and control, I think there's room for both in our system because there's times when you need to be collaborative and collegiate and work with people and there's times where you absolutely need to be in control. Um, if someone's having a heart attack, we're not going to plan you know, what we're going to do. We're just going to get into mode of this is what needs to happen, we need to do this now and now we're going to do it. Um, women are also not good at branding themselves, so men are much better at, at, at um, articulating their successes, at telling people about their work and therefore sometimes are seen as more credible. Whenever I was reading about this, one of the, one of the articles I was reading said that women generally don't toot their own horns. So they're not good at saying, yes, we've done that, I've done that well, I'm gonna take uh, credit for that. Um, men, are, men are better at that for what reason, I, I don't really know. It's not to say that men are better than women or women are better men, than men. I think there's room for, for, for both. But I suppose good teams, good senior leadership teams and good leadership teams ensure that they have a good mix of both because you get the best out of everybody then when you have that mix. So in terms of why, you know, that's some differences between men and women in their leadership styles, but in terms of nursing, what does that mean? Well, in many parts of the world, through tradition and culture and religion and all sorts of things, women are simply not seen as equal to men, unfortunately. In 1979, which isn't really that long ago, um, I don't think. Um, I would have been not even in my teens at that stage, but it's not that long ago. The UN declared that all women <coughs> should have the right to vote. And yet in 2006, Kuwait granted women the right to vote. That's only 11 years ago. Some countries are still giving women the right to vote. And we could spend the rest of the time debating nursing leadership, I think, uh, and the impact that that has on, on nursing, nursing leadership as a 90% as female profession. Um, but I think it's one of the reasons that sometimes we as female nurses have difficulties having our voice heard and getting our message across. Partly because women, nursing is seen as women's work 
It's seen as caring, it's seen as basic need, it's seen as uh, providing support and comfort. Um, and you can see this when you look back in our history, even back to the days of Florence, Florence Nightingale, where nurses provide very basic rooms around hygiene, um, around comfort, around pain, hydration and fluids, and very much in, a suppo in the supporting the medical, the doctor's role. Unfortunately, this legacy continues in many countries around the world, and not every country is lucky enough to have graduate nurses uh, and the status of profession that we have here in, in the UK. Another reason I think that we, we find it hard to uh, have our voice heard is that doctor-nurse power relationship that, that goes on sometimes, the power dynamics between the traditional male and female relationships. Although in medicine that has changed quite significantly now because there's a much higher number of females um, entering medicine. So I think that is slowly changing, um, but the power relationship still, still exists and I think it's an area of work that we'd be foolish not to recognise and, and take cognizance of. Sometimes the way in which we articulate our arguments can be seen as being a bit emotive, emotive or quite emotional in how we, women, I think sometimes can be more subjective about the issue than men. And I think one of the learning points for me is being able to stand back and present the argument in an objective way. State the case, state the facts. Don't get into the subjectivity of it all. But no matter what, any one of those three reasons or other reasons, um, the reason is that, that nursing often doesn't have a place at the right table. <coughs> Nursing's voice isn't always heard at the most strategic levels. And um, not every country in the world has a CNO. I was actually quite surprised by the number of countries that don't have a chief nurse. Many don't even have directors of nursings in, the, in, the, in their organisations. But if we're not at the table, and this, is, this was uh, discussed at the International Council of Nurses meeting in Barcelona, if we are not at the table as nurses and midwives, we are on the menu, because there's very little discussion that goes on about health and social care without nursing or midwifery being, being involved in that. So the ICN's advice to me and to you and all of us is if you're not at the table, bring your own chair. So just arrive and say, could you push up there because the nurse or the midwife needs to be heard um, at this table. The voice of nurse leaders is very, very important. I can't, I can't overemphasise that enough. And mainly I think it's because of our roles as advocates for patients, advocates for families and carers, and the ability to focus on doing the right thing. And this is a point that I'll come to, come to later. But what about me men in nursing? The stats in 2016, 11.6 male nurses were registered with the NMC. And that's a position that hasn't really changed over the last decade. The gender imbalance definitely needs to be addressed. And Janet Davies, the Chief Executive of the RCN, partly blames the continuing stereotyping of the work that, that nursing do. It's back to that woman's work thing. Um, and, and some of the terminology that we use, like sister and matron, are not words that, that facilitate men to take part in our wonderful profession. And I know there has been a huge campaign in uh, Queen's over the last few years, and it has increased male um, undergraduates from 6% to 10%, but clearly there's much more work to be done. Some of our male colleagues, um, they experience the same discrimination that we as female Females feel, but for different reasons. But um, discrimination, uh, I suppose, is just not acceptable on, on, any, on any level. And some of my male colleagues uh, have reported teasing and social stigma associated with being a nurse. And society may also think that you know, nursing is less prestigious in some way than other medical careers, and therefore can be left to the women, because they don't really need too much education. You know, they can get on and do that, and we'll not worry about that. A view, of course, which I and everyone in this room would, would dispute uh, greatly. Um, this is my beating heart, but it's okay, it'll, it'll be fine. Um, that heart actually beats, but Kevin's going to have to come up and do it, so it's okay, it's fine. It's just to say that nursing is, nursing is absolutely the heartbeat of the health and social care system. And I'm sorry if I keep saying nursing, but you, know, you understand that I do mean nursing and midwifery, and I do see them as separate professions but I'm using a collective term here. Um, the stats show that we're the, the biggest single workforce in the HSC. Uh, at the 31st of March in 2017, just passed, 
64,317, 55,000 whole time equivalents. The largest single group of, of all this, that's the, that's the total uh, staff working in the HSC. The largest single group is nursing and midwifery, sitting at just over 15,000. But remember, that does not include the independent sector. On the register, in the NMC register of, of registered nurses and midwives in Northern Ireland, it's about 21,000. So uh, nursing, as I said earlier, is the group that have most contact with patients, who provide holistic care, expert nursing intervention, as well as doing the massive job of coordinating care. And as nurses, we do whatever it takes for our patient, always focus on what's doing the right thing. And sometimes that can be really hard. So even when it is hard, it's really important that you do the right thing. We know that the evidence shows a strong correlation between the number of graduate nurses that are available for patients and the mortality and morbidity rates. So it's really important that we articulate the unique contribution that nursing and midwifery brings to care and that we can demonstrate the value and worth of our graduate nurses. And as I said, in many other places in the world where they're not that fortunate. And there are many people within the UK who would still question the value of a graduate nurse. But the evidence is very clear and I would encourage you all to utilise that evidence when you have the opportunity. <coughs> Our ambition in Northern Ireland as part of Programme for Government is to ensure that everybody lives a long and healthy active life. And the triple aim concept, which is about uh, improving population health, ensuring value for money and ensuring best patient experience, was developed by the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, which I referred to earlier. But um, if you think about that, there's a missing element, and the missing element is us, or you, the workforce. It's really important <laughs> that the workforce also have a good experience of providing care, and that we have the opportunity to ensure they have a happy working life, a work-life balance. And the IHA, t I talk about bringing joy back to work. This is very much featured in the uh, Ministers Delivering Together strategic document between now and, and 2026, a real focus on, on engaging staff. The Bengoa report you may be familiar with. Um, even though we don't have a government, and I sort of made a joke at that at the start, we're not without strategic and political direction. That was set for us by the previous minister. So we're getting on with it. We're getting on with implementing the plans and delivering together. We're taking the advice of Professor Bengoa and we're starting to transform uh, the system. As John F. Kennedy says, change is the law of life and those who look only at the past or present are certain to miss the future. We really need to be focused on the future. You guys are the future. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But what we're doing today is for the next generation of people who use health and social care services. <coughs> Taking on the message from the Bengal report and transformation, the Minister's vision sets a very challenging agenda for us, one that emphasises the need for new models of care, new ways of working, new partnerships, new relationships with communities, new relations with staff, new relationships with the people who provide care for. The Minister was very keen that services would be person-centred, that we would use a population health model and that we would deliver at sustainable <coughs> cost. And for us that means really focusing on the person-centred care approach, it means getting much more upstream in terms of prevention, it means much bigger focus on public health nursing and it means being able to articulate and justify the costs of every nurse and the, and the, the, the contribution that they make to, to outcomes. Delivering care provides a roadmap for us. It sets a, a direction of travel. It's not going to be a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. It's going to take quite a long time to get there. We know that in Northern Ireland, one in five of us have a long-term condition. 60% of us are overweight, and one in five of us have a mental health condition. There are very stark differences between health and well-being outcomes in Northern Ireland. They're the worst in the UK, even though they are improving. The differences between those in the least deprived um, in society is quite extreme. For example, men in the least deprived areas live seven and a half years longer than men in the most deprived areas, and the difference for women is four years. Delivering Together tries to set out an ambition to try and deal with some of those issues, um, and that requires us all as nurses and midwives to work in a different way. It requires us to engage with the people we provide care for in a different way, allowing them to take control of their own health care, and then we become facilitators of that, focusing very much on what matters to people, not what matters to us. 
The Minister also set up the Nursing and Middle Free Task Group. You may, you may have come across this. I know some students have been uh, involved in some of the work that's been going on very recently. <coughs> Minister O'Neill established this last October and she recognised that Nursing and Middle Free as the biggest group within the HSC had a huge contribution to make. And what she wanted was for the professions to be able to identify where the biggest impact could be made over the next 10 to 15 years. The group are working on two uh, outcomes. We enjoy long, healthy, active lives, which is part of the programme for government. And this one came from the profession itself, that registered nurses and midwives have the workforce in sufficient numbers, they're well educated, they're competent and they're supported to deliver high quality care. The recommendations from the group will be made to the Minister uh, in 2018 and I hope by then we will have a functioning assembly and, and there are three subgroups working at the moment the workforce subgroup which is the one that's really been engaging with uh, uh, nurses and midwives at the point of care the population subgroup which are starting to work uh, next week and they're working around healthy weight and um, avoiding mental health illness and the other the final subgroup is around the acute in and community interface because they're the three areas that the task group have decided have the most impact for nursing and midwifery for the future. We, know, we have already said that nursing and midwifery make a huge contribution to, to healthcare, but it's really important that the nurses and the midwives at, and the, at the point of care, at the front line as some people call them, it's a term that I don't particularly like, um, have the opportunity to have their voice heard. So I want to encourage you um, over the next coming months, if you look on the departmental website, you'll see the dates for the workshops and I would encourage you to come along and have your say about the future of your profession and, and in some way about shaping your, the career that you're going to have working in the health and social care system or indeed further afield. Just a word about the HSC Collective Leadership Strategy, given that this is um, uh, talking about women in leadership. This is our new, it's draft, it hasn't actually been uh, launched yet, so you're getting a bit of a preview. But uh, it, it's based on um, the work of Mike West in England, and it's about the value of both formal and informal relationships, and uh, that compassionate approach with staff, and, and really valuing and respecting everyone's contribution. It will support staff to take risks and learn from their mistakes. So we want an open and honest culture, not one that's blaming people for getting it wrong, one where people can feel supported to do the best that they can and when they get it wrong to be able to rectify that and learn and grow from it and to support continuous improvement and to support staff to, to carry out quality improvement work within, within their, their work. So it's something that I just highlight to you at this stage as one of the enablers for delivering together the Minister's vision and something that will be launched uh, uh, very soon. That's the collective leadership strategy recognises that leadership comes from all levels. Everybody, everybody has a, lead, a, a role to play in leadership. Leadership is not about people in senior positions. Leadership is, for me, a position that's earned, not granted, by title of your role. Um, and, and, and everybody has a role to play. So no matter what team you work in, you need to, I think, um, understand that you have a role to play. And if you see things that you think can be changed, that can be improved, or things that you're not happy about, uh, or concerns that you have that you feel able to raise them and be supported to take the appropriate action to do that. And also that it enables us to work effectively and meaningfully with the people in our care, the people who are providing care to, and to change that power relationship from us being uh, knowing what's best for people to, to people being able to tell us what really matters to them and for us then to be able to facilitate that and make it happen. So that um, quote, uh, no decision about me without me, is very much about our journey of co-production, which is supported by Delivering Together and the Leadership Strategy. So following on uh, in the footsteps of Florence, who was another trailblazer along with Jean, uh, we've, we've, we've many of them um, to talk about in, in nursing and midwifery. Um, all of you will be familiar with with, uh, with Florence, um, a force for good in, in the time of the Crimean War. I know there are some mixed views about, about her, 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 um, her leadership ability and her, and her life, but um, I think she has left us a legacy from which we have, we have developed a very strong tradition um, of, of good nursing practice. She was educated and well connected and she turned convention on its head by becoming, by becoming a nurse. Nurses um, were described as notoriously uh, known for improper conduct, 
um, for being drunk, frankly, a lot of the time, and uh, they couldn't be trusted to even do the simplest of tasks. And we know that Florence became a trailblazing nurse who, who, who greatly improved care in the 19th and 20th century. Um, a formidable char character, absolutely, as a nurse, <coughs> um, as a manager. She was an innovator, she was a teacher, she was a statistician. Um, and she was a very skilled woman operating in a very male-dominated domi world at the time. On her return from, from uh, the Crimean War, Queen Victoria invited her to Balmoral um, so that she might make the acquaintance of one who has set such a bright example uh, for women. The Prince Consort Albert was so impressed by what he heard from Miss Nightingale at that meeting um, and her nurses that he designed a brooch for her and it was inscribed, Blessed be the Merciful. During her lifetime she led nursing, even when she was sick and from her bed when she couldn't get out of bed and played a really important part in, in the enormous change which has happened around the treatment of, of illness and infection control as you'll know. Each year one of the privileges that I have as CNO is to attend the Westminster Abbey to celebrate the life of Florence Nightingale and part of this service is about the procession of the lamp, Florence's lamp. The lamp is carried usually by a senior nurse, always supported by a group of students and the students are picked from each of the four UK countries. Um, Northern Ireland had the opportunity I think about three years ago so unfortunately you're going to miss that one but maybe um, first year students might, might have that opportunity in the future. The thing about the lamp is that uh, the light from the lamp signifies the passage of knowledge from one generation to another. It's incumbent of all of us as nurse leaders to share our knowledge and to teach and to facilitate the inquiring mind and to bring on the next generation of, of nurses. The procession of the lamp also represents the passing of, value, of values of good nursing practice. And as I said, my values have always been about care and compassion and dignity and respect. So you can see that Florence Nightingale, a great nurse that she was in a leadership role, is actually still very contemporary. Her values live on, the spreading of the knowledge, the sharing of information and the passing on of good traditional values is an important part of being a nurse. And as you grow and develop in your career, you will have many opportunities um, to role model that good practice. Moving on then to our, our own nurse leaders. Um, we've had many to be proud of, just three here. Uh, some in this room, Jean's here, Donna's here, they're, um, Marianne, uh, people who've, who've led the way, who've been innovative and creative I in their work. As Donna's already said, and Jean was head of school here at Queen's, um, and a huge part of the tradition of nursing in Northern Ireland. She led the way in many different areas of the profession, and has, I think it's fair to say, very strong and clear views about about her opinions and her beliefs and her values, which she has never been afraid to articulate, and I think that's part of being a great le leader is being able to stand by your convictions um, and, and be proud of be proud of that. Dr. Mona Gray, uh, the first salaried secretary of the Royal College of Nursing and the first chief nursing officer in Northern Ireland in 1960, and Dame Mary U. Pritchard, uh, director of midwifery education at the Northern Ireland College of Midwifery and President of the UKCC, which was formerly, which has now become the NMC, um, and Vice President of the Royal College of Midwives. But their stories live on in the books, and uh, Donna has already referred to Jean's role in uh, <coughs> Nurses' Voices. Many of the stories in this are stories of heroism, bravery, fun, tragedy, careers and caring um, that have come from Northern Ireland in the dark days. While many of us, me included, were still honing our skills as young, as young nurses in a time of conflict. Jean uh, wrote the, the uh, edited the, 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 the book and um, what she said was that over the course of 30 years, more than 3,600 people were killed and tens of thousands of people injured during the troubles in Northern Ireland. <coughs> for the healthcare professionals who cared for the victims in the worst times, in the worst troubles, brought out the best of people. Nurses rose to the challenge of caring for their patients for whichever side they came from under very testing conditions. And throughout it, it's all these nurses showed incredible reserves of patience, determination, fortitude and courage. And I think they're very good descriptors of, of nursing at its best. Um, when things are really difficult, when the chips are down, it's often the nurses who come to the fore in creating um, the best 
possible scenarios in very difficult circumstances. With my colleagues from the other three uh, UK countries, I was delighted to lead work on behalf of the NMC around professionalism. And the ultimate purpose of professionalism in nursing midwifery is to ensure the consistency of provision of safe, effective, um, good care, person-centred care that support people and their families and their careers and their carers. Sorry, you will have noticed that this has been one of the opportunities to lead and influence for me as as a lead nurse to influence the regulator and the role that we have uh, in, in shaping the regulation of the profession to maintain patient safety. Registered nurses and midwives practicing at graduate level are prepared with the right behaviours, the knowledge and the skills required to provide this safe, effective person-centred care. We're professionally socialised to practice in a compassionate, interprofessional and collaborative manner. This is recognised through continuing and registered nurse and midwifery status with the NMC. Practice and behaviours are underpinned by the code and in part of the code there are the four P's. And the, the enabling professionalism work, which is available on the NMC website, tries to really unpick the, the, the four P's in the code and apply it to your practice. So being accountable is about practicing effectively. Being comp uh, competent is about preserving safety. Being a leader is about promoting professionalism and trust, autonomous practice, being a coordinator, being honest, being innovative and being a system thinker. And being an advocate is about prioritising people. We had a start an example recently of a nurse advocating for a patient in America. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but I'm going to show you a very short clip if Kevin would like to come to my assistance. Um, I saw it on Twitter a couple of weeks ago and I wondered why there wasn't more commentary about it. This is a modern day example of nursing leading care and doing the right thing. So this is about a one and a half minute video of the nurse in uh, Utah being arrested for, for um, for articulating, articulating the best, the best, uh, the rights of her patients. This is the video that brought the case to light. Salt Lake City nurse Alice Wobble taken into custody because she wouldn't follow a police officer's orders to take blood from an unconscious patient. The video clearly shows the nurse explaining it's illegal to take a blood sample except under very specific circumstances. But the officer was not swayed. Today, official reaction from Salt Lake City's mayor and police chief. What I saw is completely unacceptable. This is caught between law enforcement and the nurses we work so closely with. The officer wanted blood from the driver of a semi. The trucker had been hit by a car driven by a suspect going in the wrong direction during a police pursuit. So the trucker was not even suspected of doing anything wrong. So there was no clear reason to even want a sample. The officer remains on duty as Internal Affairs investigates. Dave Carlin, CBS2 News. Now the nurse was released after 20 minutes in custody. She was never charged. So, um, you want to create a stunning website? Oh dear. I'm already done. Mm -hmm. So um, that's just to show you a modern day example of a nurse in, in, in uh, providing leadership and doing the right thing for a patient against, in very difficult and challenging circumstances. Um, and to say to you that I think the most important role that we do is to advocate on behalf of our patients. That's the one unique difference that I think we have probably above other, other professional groups. At times that can be really challenging, but you should never shy away from that. From that. I'm just going to go to the end anyway, so just click on the one. one. Yeah. You should, and the, la the one just before that. Um, the one, you should never shy away from that challenge. But the most important thing I think to remember is that, you know, a long career, career ahead of you, many of you will have unique opportunities to work in very challenging circumstances. You'll have in opportunities to influence policy, you'll have opportunities to influence education, you'll have opportunities to influence practice. Grasp those opportunities and make sure that all of you have a voice at the table, that you're not on the menu. And remember, and this quote from Roald Dahl, I began to realise how important it was 
to be an enthusiast in life. If you are interested in something, no matter what it is, go at it with full speed. Embrace it with both arms, hug it, love it, and above all, become passionate about it. Lukewarm is no good. That's how I feel about nursing. Embrace it, love it, and it will embrace and love you. I hope you have uh, an enjoyable the rest of your day. I know there's another class waiting to get in. And um, congratulations on getting this far. And uh, I look forward to meeting many of you when you start your careers as, as, as registered nurses. Thanks very much. I'd like to take this opportunity just to very sincerely thank you, Charlotte, oh. for sharing with us your, your thoughts and your feelings about nurse leadership and the role that many of us as women in this room play in that. So thank That's you very much for coming today. Thank you. I would also like to take the opportunity to, to uh, really acknowledge the, the considerable contribution over very many years that Professor Jean Orr has made to the School of Nursing and Midwifery and indeed continues to make and I would like to wish her the very, very best and say thank you uh, on all our behalfs. <laughs>